Uh, today we are going to discuss about detection of cracks in shafts. Okay, uh, because you know predominantly you would have seen if cracks occur, uh, materials and structures fail. But we need to monitor the cracks. And in fact, to monitor the system so that the cracks can be detected at an early stage, because invariably you know cracks can occur in any system, be it a shaft, be it a plate cracks can occur because of many reasons. Okay. Cracks are sometimes visible if they are on the surface okay. and they are if they are invisible they are inside the body. Okay. Particularly there are methods you know once there are uh, cracks are occurring in a system what happens? this is a shaft which is rotating. Obviously, its strength is going to weaken, strength is going to decrease and eventually if this crack goes undetected, the component of the material is going to fail and then we will have catastrophic uh, uh, consequences because of such a failure. Okay. Imagine a case of a railway axle okay, where we have this wheels going on this axles and suppose this cracks occur and then the systems fail, then we are going to have a problem because there will be derailment accidents etcetera. So, cracks have to be detected at an early stage. Okay. Now, if you will notice here, this crack a very generic crack is going to weaken the structure. Its strength is going to decrease. And once the shafts are rotating, or systems are rotating, this becomes still a very complicated issue. Things are rotating, okay. and if say imagine if there are uh, weights being carried on the shaft, because they are rotating, these cracks are subjected to varying loads. There will be fatigue loads on the crack. And a material subjected to fatigue lo loads is going to fail much quickly compared to a static load. Okay. Imagine if the, I have this, this as a shaft and this is rotating and there is a small crack and every time this rotating this crack is going to open close open close and then eventually because of fatigue loading it is going to fail much quickly. Okay. This is something which we need not, uh, we should not do. This is one type of cracks and we in this class we are going to focus on such cracks on shafts which are visible from the outside and how we can reduce them. But cracks do occur in structures like I was telling you inside the structure outside the structure. If it is inside the structures it is very difficult to visually see it. So, people do what is known as the ultrasonic inspection and we are going to study about this uh, later on ultrasonic inspection or what is known as the NDT type of test. Okay. But <coughs> one thing you will notice here, if a crack has occurred the machine or the local area around the uh, shaft is going to be not that stiff, it is going to have stiffness is going to reduce. Stiffness is going to reduce. Reduce is a pretty strong word I would say stiffness, stiffness is going to change if a crack has occurred in a system. Okay. And you will recall the natural frequency of any system is root over k by m. So, if there is a change in the stiffness obviously, there is a change in the natural frequency. So, with this you know you will see there are methods by doing the eigenvalue analysis of a system, we can find out the change in the natural frequency and then say maybe a crack has occurred. The system's transfer function is going to change. If you all recall the mobility of a system
is defined by force by velocity, is not it. Okay. And then we have the impedance impedance is inverse of mobility, is not it? Okay. So, by giving an excitation to the system some force by measuring some velocity, I can find out the system's impedance. Okay. The system say impedance in fact this is the reverse this is impedance. Yeah, impedance is force by velocity and impedance is the inverse of mobility. So, I by changing giving an excitation to a system, I will measure its response. If a crack has occurred, okay, this mobility is going to change. That is also another way of detecting a crack of a system has uh, undergone or not. Okay. Before we go into the discussions on the methods to find out cracks, let me tell you what are the two types of cracks which can occur in a shaft. Okay. So, in this class as I was telling you, we are going to focus only on shafts uh, which have cracks and cracks which occur inside structures will be dealt when we discuss about ultrasonics. So, a load on a shaft could be because of bending loads shafts are supported on bearings, these are bearings ok. There could be a crack and there could be some bending load because of a weight ok. And then we are going to have this kind of a crack which is usually transfers almost in this line these are <coughs> transverse crack ok. And uh, if I exaggerate it in the drawing, so each type the crack is uh, the shaft is rotating at once it comes to the bottom because of the loads it is going to close. So, there is a load here strong load here it is going to open and close once it goes to the top this crack is going to close and again it comes down it will uh, sorry once it comes down it will close it goes up it will open. So, this opening and closing of cracks occur in a rotating shaft and this is known as the crack breathing. Now, to our naked eyes at times this will be not visible at all. Okay. And another parameter by which the cracks are defined is actually if this is the diameter of the shaft as d and the crack depth is a this is a non dimensionalized parameter a by d crack depth to the diameter. And usually of course, you know if a by d is 0.5 it is almost till the diameter I mean no system would go till even 0.5 because the structure would have become so weak it would have failed usually 0 0.1 about 10 percent of the d a is equal to is the limit I mean beyond which we cannot have any uh, structure sustained loads beyond crack depth of 10 percent more than the uh, shaft diameter. Okay. So, we have to keep a, a track on this is the parameter by which this crack is uh, defined and this is usually uh, negligible it is like an hairline you know, if you are talking about a crack of a shaft of um, about 12 mm diameter even this dimension could be about 0.5 mm okay. very thin hairline crack. Okay. In, the, in our laboratory I will show you 
we have done experiments wherein we use a hacksaw to cut a slot and make a crack also and that is that is a massive crack I mean having a hacksaw cutting a slot on a soft. Okay. But usually this cracks are hairline uh, cracks. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a type of crack and which is known as uh, the transverse crack because of the flexural loading on the shaft. Okay. Another important thing happens actually as you know uh, the shafts usually carry torsional loads, they transmit power, so they carry a lot of torque. And usually because of the torque you know the maximum shear stress occurs in the 45 degree lines. Okay, if you are transmitting torque, usually the cracks are at this 45 degree axis and somewhere here. Okay. And these are the slant cracks. And if you see cracks oriented on a shaft in these uh, lines, you can know these cracks are because of the torsional loading on the shaft and not because of the flexural loading. Fre flexural loading as I just told you, they will be transverse in nature. So, essentially in shafts, either a transverse crack occurs, a slant crack occurs or a combination of them, both of them occur because of the type of loading which is there on the shaft which is usually a flexural loading because of the bending forces or the torsional loading because of the torsional moment which the shafts are carrying. And so, what are the symptoms or signs by which we can detect whether a crack has occurred through uh, vibration monitoring. Number one is the stiffness will change. Okay. So, we can monitor the eigenvalues or the natural frequency. Number two, the mobility inverse of the impedance mobility will change. So, we have to do through impedance measurements. Of course, once we are discussing through vibration monitoring, there are techniques uh, beyond vibration monitoring by which cracks <coughs> are detected and these are usually stationary cracks on structures. One is through the NDT techniques of dye penetrant test, particularly to find out you know hairline cracks on castings. Particularly, I will just give an example. So, for example, we cast an engine cylinder block, okay. There are so this is some view section of a cylinder block. And a crack has occurred, a very thin hairline crack. Okay. Now, if you uh, uh, see a cylinder block, there are many things which happen. There are in a cylinder block, there are a lot of water passages which are uh, made in the casting itself, so that the cooling water goes all around the uh, cylinder uh, block. Okay. Now, they are under pressure. So, if there is a crack, what is going to happen? This water is going to ooze out. Okay. So, how do you detect such kind of cracks? So, that is why they do what is known as a dye penetrant test after the cracks are uh, the after the castings are done, they smear it with a dye okay, and then rub it off. And if if the crack is there, this dye after you have smeared the surface the dye and this dye will make a mark when ooze out and clearly show that uh, uh, crack has occurred. 
just looking at the dye. And this dye could be not visible in the naked eye, it could have a fluorescent lamp to where the dye is going to glow and then you can clearly see that a crack has occurred. That is one way which we will discuss later on in the ultrasonic uh, in the NDT test sec section. And another uh, crack detection technique you know, which they do for shafts which are rotating particularly imagine in railway bogies or wagons, rolling mills, paper mills, cement plants, here we have a axle of the train which is rotating, if the crack is inside it will have consequence uh, that the structure is going to weaken it will fail. Rolling mills a lot of rolls you know are there which run continuously. If a roll breaks the steel plant the cold rolling mill or the hot rolling mill uh, cannot produce. Paper mills there are about 100 200 mills uh, rolling um, rolls the rolls crack the paper mill is going to uh, get shut down. Cement mill the rotary kiln a okay, big shell about 2-3 uh, meters in diameter which rotates when there is a crack okay, eventually the system is going to weaken and fail. So, these are actually tested by an NDT technique of ultrasonics. Okay, we will discuss about the dye penetrant and the ultrasonics in the later class, but again in this class I wanted to focus on the dynamics of cracks in a shaft and how do we monitor it. So, uh, we know that we can measure the mechanical impedance of such a system, we can measure the natural frequencies of a system because if cracks occur the stiffness is going to change and so the natural frequency is going to change and then let us see how we can do that. Okay. This is a, a setup here which we have in the laboratory and if you can see here uh, we have a crack and if you will see there are two discs of aluminum two flanges basically and these flanges are held together by four bolts and eventually if you will see here this is actually a crack shaft okay shaft is totally cracked and to simulate cracks what you do is tighten these four bolts okay loosen maybe the top two or any two or any one so that at one end of the crack maybe if i if i draw it here if you see here we have put two flanges there are actually two crack shafts already and then if you bring them together and then put bolts okay we, we join them kind of and then if you if you loosen this and tighten this this cracks maybe in this shaft maybe could be like this okay so to stimulate crack we do this in the laboratory okay and what we do here is again if when we have a crack shaft we always measure at the bearing locations as i told you beforehand in condition mounting usually when you monitor rotating machines this is the only good place we have to keep the transducers and here also we have to keep the transducers on these two bearing locations and this black disc here is actually a loader it's a heavy weight which is rotating on along the side this cracks so that this is responsible for giving that load uh, bending load which is coming down and which will be responsible for opening and closing of the crack and create this breathing mode. Okay. So, we have uh, uh, you got the vibration measurements from this uh, system and I will show it to you later on and then we will another setup which we do is to find out the mechanical impedance like I told you the techniques for detecting shaft cracks are mechanical impedance and then the eigenvalue analysis. Okay. Uh, this is an experiment which we did in the laboratory. Okay and uh, this is a shaft wherein and if you will see this is about a 12 mm shaft 
and we, we where we cut a sawtooth crack onto the shaft okay by just by using a hacksaw okay. now because of this we rotate it at a particular speed and then we try to see what is the change in the mobility okay actually these two graphs summarize the results let me explain you what we did here okay uh, what we did essentially is we measured the mobility okay now to do that what we did is we have this system wherein you see this shaft where is a heavy disc and then this particular heavy disc here okay and then where we introduced a crack very close to the disc okay so this disc is responsible for opening and closing the shaft and we try to measure the impedance of the system at any one bearing locations so what we had is an exciter you see this black one here is actually an exciter okay and this exciter we are giving a force in signal so this exciter is exciting the structure and here what we have is an impedance head impedance head is a transducer i told you which has a force gauge and a accelerometer together so that i will measure the acceleration of this system and measure the force which is being applied this acceleration will be double integ uh, single integrated to get the velocity so i know the velocity i know the force to the system and then thus i know the mobility okay so mobility of the system is known for a uh, uncracked system when we we did with two measurements with a good system wherein the crack uh, the shaft had no crack and next we replace that shaft with a shaft which had crack so we have this two ratios you know the response to uh, m cracked with m original mobility with crack system to mobility with the uh, on crack system this two ratios okay and then you will see here uh, this is at uh, this x axis is the crack depth alpha which i told as a by d you know we have gone as high as 0.4 pretty high okay a by d is 0.4 and we have run the system at two different frequencies one was 22.75 hertz and one is at 40 hertz okay and you will see how with crack depth suddenly this mobility changes okay and this is a good indication that by monitoring the mobility of a system i can tell that the system has undergone a crack okay just by monitoring vibration i would not be able to tell whether a soft crack has occurred okay and this is actually published in one of our uh, journal papers okay so to summarize you know uh, this for different various crack depths and different mobility mobility is very very sensitive at uh, and these are at, at the rotational speeds 22.75 40 hertz uh, 22.75 at 120 hertz and so on at different speeds we have seen the mobility so in a system if we want to say for example let's talk about a gas turbine okay so if you want to place a system in a gas turbine to monitor whether cracks have occurred or not you can do this a gas turbine has long long uh, rotors with sets of compressor blades you know, low, low pass uh, low pressure stage high pressure stage combustion and then the turbine etc all these are sets of vanes compressor turbine etc so what we have to do is do through a modal testing through experimental model analysis well what is experimental model analysis basically we found out the transfer function of a system response to the excitation 
okay in uh, in our case mobility is nothing but velocity by force and impedance is force by velocity so to a unknown system where we have to do crack monitoring all we have to do is give a certain known force at the frequency of operation suppose a gas turbine rotates predominantly at say maybe maybe 24000 rpm to maybe 30000 rpm okay and this will correspond to 24000 by 60 400 to 500 hertz okay so from a range of 400 to 500 hertz or few of its multiple you excite this system through a force how do you excite the system through an exciter usually because it's a, a large uh, gas turbine we can use heavy electro dynamic exciters i give a known force f from the frequency maybe 400 to 2000 hertz and at the same time at the bearing locations obviously but in the Uh, turbines because they are supported with many bearings okay at any of the bearing locations you can measure the force and then with the suitable transducer you can mount an accelerometer etc measure the velocity measure the force and plot a mobility curve v by f as a function of frequency okay and then now all you have to do is continuously keep on monitoring v and f by continuously i mean you know you need not do the force give, give the force excitation every time but momentarily you now every day once you measure v by f every day once you measure v by f suddenly you will see this v by f if if we if we do the ratio of the so this is my original and the, which i say as m not okay and then you will have m nu m nu is v nu by f nu so you will plot m not by as a function of frequency and you will see that with a crack occurring suddenly you know this should have shot up okay like you go back to the slide here i am plotting m nu to m not as a function of uh, crack depth but at particular frequency i can monitor them okay and these frequencies are the operating speeds and i will see that with a uh, particular crack depth it is increasing okay as the crack depth has increased this value is going to increase okay because you see this this is crack depth if crack has increased this is going to increase okay so at a particular frequency i can i can decide on the frequencies frequencies usually will be the operating frequencies operating frequencies and, and this this is uh, out of our research which we did about you know 10 uh, years ago okay and just measuring uh, the mechanical mobility of system to monitor cracks occurring in a system you can get a reference to this paper at my uh, website this has come out in uh, jasa in year 2002 okay uh, volume 112 uh, number 6 pages to 2825 2 2 3 3 3 0 the details about this technique are given in that paper of ours okay wherein uh, just by monitoring the mobility of a system we can tell whether a crack has occurred in a system or not okay 
Now, uh, let us, uh, so you know, in a nutshell, to monitor the occurrence of cracks in large systems, you have to measure the mobility of such a system periodically. And if the mobility value increases, you will get an indication that the crack has developed or crack is growing. And once happens, you know, crack also takes time to grow and that is what is saving us. If the cracks occur suddenly without no reasons and they did not grow and they just fail, it would be disastrous. So, crack takes time to grow and this helps us in the prognostics. Okay, you have the you know the family, uh, famous Paris equation for the crack growth rate. This depends on the material property, the crack uh, dimensions etcetera. So, it takes time to grow and eventually crack will grow to a such an extent the material ha would have become weak and it would fail. But through a mobility measurement initially when the crack has occurred and it has just grown to few a's you know point five, where a I define as the crack depth by d. If the crack has increased we will see that the mobility value suddenly shoots up. So, mobility is sensitive to crack other than just monitoring the velocity of vibration. By velocity of vibration it would be very difficult for us to monitor whether the crack has occurred, but by doing the mobility the measurements we can surely say the crack has occurred. Uh, this is what actually happens is another uh, view of the better drawing of that is this is what I meant by uh, this crack occurring at a distance crack can have a maximum distance of L at a location x from one of the bearings. So, is a rotor here the shaft of diameter d and a is the crack depth which you define as ok. And uh, because of these uh, there will be forces coming in the bearings, the stiffnesses are going to change, displacements are going to happen and so on ok. And when the crack shaft rotates this is how the stiffness varies, this is what is the breathing model for the transverse crack ok. In a complete rotation this is how the shaft undergoes ok. The flex the stiffness changes, the flexibility changes because the cracks are opening closing, opening closing at any location the flexibility which I measure at the uh, bearing locations are going to change ok. The stiffness is going to vary. Now, let us see what happens in the case of the breathing behavior for a slant crack. Here I am subjected them to a torsional loading ok and the cracks have occurred in the 45 degree axis. So, cracks will once open and once close. This is also the breathing behavior of a crack, but it is slant. But then the question would be how do I distinguish between whether a crack has occurred because of a torsional load or because of a bending load. Because once you have to do the diagnostics, okay, if you, you, you will see eventually a crack has occurred in the 45 degree axis. Okay. But if you are measuring the vibrations, you would not know perhaps you know whether it is a breathing mode or because of a slant crack or a transverse crack. And how do you because I need to know the cause of the crack. Was it a transverse load which created the crack? Was it a torsional load? Or another fundamental uh, question uh, which you would be wondering is okay, a designer would have taken care of the loads. So, why crack is occurring? Okay. To answer that question there are many ways. So, these materials which are used to make the case of a shaft. Say for example, let me take the case of a pulley. By pulley I mean a pulley of a conveyor system by let me it is not the conventional pulley which we use for uh, power transmission and in, in our you know maybe small motors or uh, pumps, 
but I am talking about conveyors where and these are actually supported on bearings and this length could be about 2 meters just give feel of the dimensions and this diameter could be about 0 0.5 meter okay and this thickness of this it's a hollow drum okay and then there are some end plates here onto which we we put a shaft okay and this thickness is about 20 mm okay now the shaft is solid shaft is solid solid shaft onto which we have the end plates this is the shell usually on this shell uh, they usually put a rubber material to protect the shell okay this is known as the lagging rubber material and in a conveyor okay uh, there could be you know series of such pulleys okay and there would be this conveyor which is going on this belts okay and this could be a big ship here okay carrying maybe coal okay and then there's a crane here at the port okay which will scoop and then drop it at a bin and then this this is getting transmitted tra uh, transferred and this comes to the place where there will be railway wagons okay carrying the coal and out and this could be as long as maybe 1 kilometer okay and each of these you know these are there maybe maybe you know 5 meters apart or 2 meters uh, 5 meters apart we have put this uh, conveyor pulleys and they could be carrying coal at the rate of maybe 5000 tons an hour okay this this is the typical scenario of if you go to any port okay either the loading circuit or the unloading circuit either in, in our country in, in all of the ports we do unloading on the loading of the iron ore we send out the good iron ore and get the good coals from outside because we have coal not good coals in our country or uh, we get the coals in and the iron ore goes out in the conveyor systems and in such a system if a crack occurs in a pulley of the conveyor the conveyor is not going to work okay now question is a designer would have done a good design to ensure that the cracks uh, or this conveyor system does not fail but there has been instances i have i have seen some of the pulleys the material of the pulley okay is supposed to be isotropic steel of a particular grade usually it is low carbon steel okay with a particular and you know, this uh, pulleys are made out of plates okay these plates are produced by hot rolling okay and then they are welded at one location they are welded at one location and imagine welding a 20 mm plate okay there will be a lot of heat concentration at one zone around the weld and that is known as the hsz heat 
affected zone. So, usually after welding, you have to do good amount of post weld heat treatment, post weld heat treatment. Otherwise, what happens if you look at the microstructure of such systems, such plates or around this, you will see that the grain sizes are not uniform and there could be banding in it and this could, this could be you know ferrites and this could be perlites and this banding gives rise to alternate hard and soft areas around the weld. Okay. For a uh, designer, when I design it, I when I take a value of stress, I assume that the stress is uniform everywhere, hardness is uniform everywhere, that is fine. But when I manufacture it, when I have done on welding, my heat treatment was not proper, I have artificially created high zones of soft material, high zones of hard material and you are rotating a soft and a hard material together. Okay, one zone is soft, one zone is hard and this is how because of one inherent defect, this crack is going to originate and then if one crack goes unnoticed, it is weakening the structure, few more cracks will come up and then once cracks start to propagate with time, because you are rotating it, cracks will propagate and eventually system will fail and this is what actually happens and that is why you will see all those you know bridges which see in our country, Hada bridge, the new bridge, why do they never weld those structures? Do you know why they do not weld? Because of these problems. That is why they rivet, they make a hole and rivet and bolt. Because heat treatment cannot be done at such a larger scale in situ in a large uh, place where you are going to weld things. Okay. So, post weld heat treatment is very, very essential to prevent failures in mechanical systems. Many mechanical structures systems have failed because of crack, because of fatigue, only because the post weld heat treatment was not done correctly to ensure that I have uniform grain size. So, this, otherwise the material is going to have hard zones, soft zones, the temperature time cooling curve after welding is very, very important. If you have studied iron carbon diagram, you see how these the carbon compound, uh, if you quickly quickly cool it, you will have a hard material, there will be a lot of martensite formation. We have to slowly cool it, there have to be a lot of perlite formation. So, heat treatment becomes essential, but as a maintenance engineer, we need not worry about it. We assume that the guys who have designed it, who have manufactured it would have taken care of these, but when we go to site a system has failed, they will all point to the bearing because that is why we have where we have put the transducer, they will say because the bearing has failed, the whole system has failed. No, that is not true because the person who had manufactured it did not do a good weld job, perhaps did not do a good post weld heat treatment after the welding. So, such uh, variations in the microstructure occurred, such hard variations uh, in hardness occurred and thus the crack initiated. Okay, this is a one case study you all should remem remember in particular and usually uh, I should tell you usually when you are doing a welding actually when you weld you know you have to go to the melting point temperature usually for steel if a plate is uh, 20 mm thick immediately after welding, you have to hold at that weld temperature that material which have been fused for about 1 hour. That means, you should not cool it suddenly. If you quench it in a cold bath, there will be uh, there will be brittle surface on the top, it will harden and then it will crack. Okay. So, we have to always hold it. At many times the fabricators at site 
do not do this because to hold it at the temperature you have to insulate it usually an asbestos cloth is put put over the weld and even before you weld it suddenly you cannot bring for a room uh, material from a room temperature and suddenly start to heat it they are slowly heated up to bring to a temperature okay and then the welding is done held for 1 hour at that uh, temperature if it is 20 mm thick and then slowly it is cool and that is usually done by covering the weld with an asbestos cloth and if you do these things you can avoid cracks in systems and shafts okay another reason of course the cracks occur because of casting defects blow holes blow holes in castings which go undetected poor casting and then of course these blow holes etc can be uh, checked by ultrasonic uh, testing okay now uh, this is another thing i in the last uh, few slides before this we had shown you about mobility here we will show you about the change in eigen frequencies okay or the natural frequencies once the crack occurs this is again the normalized eigen frequency the first three eigen frequencies with crack depth increasing you will see at per some particular frequencies they are very very sensitive to the change in the eigen frequencies so eigen frequencies um, mobility are true indicators that a cracking has occurred if you just monitor one eigen uh, frequency you may not be able to see you have to normalize them with respect to the original natural frequency how much is the variation with respect to the original mobility how much is the variation just by doing an absolute mobility measurement or an eigen value measurement you will not be able to know what the natural uh, what the ch uh, change has occurred because of cracking but if you take the ratios this clearly show that this kind of changes do occur okay now a lot of uh, signal processing techniques have been used to detect crack all uh, also particularly though in, in this class we are not going to discuss about uh, the details of uh, non stationary signals i will just tell you briefly particularly when you start up a shafting system or which is known as a coast up or coast down and if you do something what is known as an wavelet analysis and if i have a shaft some velocity presence <coughs> of sub harmonic lobes indicates cracked cracks <coughs> and this can only be done when we <coughs> excuse me when we coast up or coast down a system by coasting up i mean changing the speed ramping up the speed okay, from zero to a some value when you are ramping up because the signals are not at constant speed this is a non stationary signal then we can see this kind of uh, lobes happening once you do an wavelet analysis though in this course we are not going to discuss about wavelet analysis so through advanced signal processing technique 
we can uh, also detect cracks. Okay. Earlier, you know, people were never monitoring cracks through such vibration monitoring. They only did an NDT test either through ultrasonics or dye penetrant to locate cracks. But nowadays, with the improvement and the understanding of the science, and then this algorithms have come up, people can uh, find out the um, occurrence of such cracks in such systems. Okay. Now, uh, to do the impedance analysis of the cracks in the laboratory, uh, these are some of the data which we use. The length of the shaft was about 50 centimeter, diameter was 2 centimeter, and the density etcetera and then the first eigenvalue value was 24.27 hertz uh, rotor was rotating at uh, 9.55 hertz so with this kind of an uh, simulation we <coughs> did the analysis <coughs> and this last table here gives an indication of how do you compare comparison of the transverse crack with slant crack so when there is a breathing opening and closing of crack cracks breathe with a frequency equal to rotation of sp shaft speed in <coughs> the transverse crack and in the case of a slant crack <coughs> excuse me they breathe with a frequency equal to the torsional uh, frequency here the in the transverse crack the eigen values reduce significantly compared to that in the case of the slant crack in the steady state response, the FFT shows the characteristics 1x, 2x, 3x, but in the slant crack, they show the subharmonic and superharmonic of the rotational speed. By sub means less than the rotational speed, super means more than the rotational speed. In transient analysis, we can use the wavelets to detect transient crack, like I uh, told you, and then the in the case of the response to impulse, when I give an impulse force, the normalized mechanical impedance is highly sensitive to crack depth in the case of the transfer shaft and in the uh, case of the slant crack, it is uh, relatively less. So, to summarize uh, what we discussed today, cracks can occur in structures, cracks can occur in rotating shafts. To monitor the cracks in rotating systems, we can use the method of eigenvalue analysis or the mobility analysis to find out whether cracks have occurred. <coughs> to find out cracks in structure, we can do NDT testing of uh, structures by ultrasonics or dye penetrant. Okay. And <coughs> this cracks rotating cracks sorry cracks in rotating shafts could be either transverse or slant and the transverse cracks are created because of the flexural or the bending loads and the slant cracks are created because of the torsional loads and uh, you have seen the relative sensitivity of the one crack to the other uh, towards mobility towards eigenvalues and which could be used as indicators for detecting cracks in rotating shafts and of course cracks do take time to grow and that is the breathing room we have till we take remedial measurements and cracks why they occur because of defects in casting, defects in welding, post weld hill treatment was not appropriate, the raw material during rolling was not appropriate, hot rolling was not done properly and so on. Okay. Okay. Thank you.